what's your, what's your, what's your surname again? And I said, it's Christopher. And he said, you're from PNG? And I said, yeah. And he said, it's a bit different because a lot of PNG people don't have Christopher as their surname. Um, he said he was expecting my name to be like some strange name. But I told him, no, that's my name. And he said, yeah, that's unique. But uh, yeah, my name is Elijah. My middle name is Danny, Daniel, whatever. And yeah, so my surname is Christopher. So the reason why I said that was because Sonny instructed me during the week. He said, just make sure you introduce yourself and tell us about who you are. But yeah, so my name is Elijah Christopher. And what I do is we design and build swimming pools. And um, I get to swim in some of the most expensive pools and fancy pools in Brisbane. That's one of the, um, well, you can say highlights, but I'd say it's one of the uh, privilege of working in the swimming pool industry. We get to swim a lot in summer, which is good. So, um, but I left that job and now I'm working with a different company. It's, it's like a, we're more specialized in uh, working with vinyl liner pools. So, yeah, so that's what I do. But I serve as an elder at Mount Gravette Church. And uh, yeah, it has been good so far. And what I've learned so far is that people are strange in a good way because they're unique. And um, I've got three sisters and like, my older sister, she's 10 minutes older than me, so we are twins. But not identical twins, fraternal twins. Uh, uh, but she's much more better looking. <laughs> and then she works in some business stuff and the sister below us, her name's Olive, she's a teacher. And then we have a younger sister, her name's Esther, she's 12. Mom and dad tried to get a boy they tried three times, but they missed three times. <laughs> um, and what else do you need to know about me? Let me think. I think that's all you need to know about me. <laughs> but I'm so happy to be here this morning to see, um, yeah, like Brother Sonny is one of my good friends, and Zach there as well, and Mana, one of our pathfinders here. It's good to see you all. And it's really good to see every one of you this morning. And I, I uh, title of my remarks today is Restoration. And that's what I do. Like, I don't normally use PowerPoints because my idea is that w w when you use a lot of PowerPoints, people focus on the PowerPoints more than they focus on you. And, and, and whatever you say, it doesn't register. And that's why I didn't use PowerPoint intentionally. Not that I'm lazy, but that, that's uh, intentionally. That's why when, when Brother Sony asked me about the PowerPoint, I said I won't be using PowerPoint. So I hope it's all right. And uh, you will be using your Bible a lot today. And so, yeah, I just also want to um, yeah, extend a welcome to our virtual audience if you're watching online. I just, um, it is my prayer that we all will receive the same blessing. And by the time this day is done, by the time everyone leaves this place, may we be challenged, disturbed, and moved by the Holy Spirit and to make some solid and firm decision before we leave this place. And that is my prayer. And there's a little bit about me. And now we're going to be going into the Bible. So I'm just going to ask everyone, if you can, if you can, please kneel and I'll, I'll, I'll pray. Our loving Father in heaven, it is a privilege to call you our Father. And we just want to thank you for blessing us with this opportunity or, or, or the privilege of coming together in this place to worship you in peace. And I believe that you have a special message for us today. And I am not going to invite you to be amongst us this morning because it is evident that you were here before we got here because your presence can be felt in a profound way. 
And so I just pray that may you tune our hearts and our minds to be receptive to your word. I also pray for the little ones amongst us this morning. I pray that may you simplify the word so that even the little kid can understand. And I just pray for myself, Lord, you know who I am and I'm not worthy to be able to preach your word. But I just want to thank you for allowing me to have this privilege. And I just pray that may you use this segment for your glory. And, and may your name be glorified through it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now the, the, the topic is restoration. And by the time I finish, we'll at least grab an idea of why I title it restoration. Now because I'm going to have some Bible text, yes. Some text, I'm, I'm going to read it and some... I'm going to ask you to look it up. So if you have your Bible, you can, you can employ it. Or if you have your, your, your pen, you can write it down and go back home and do your own study. Now, the title is Restoration. And, and restoration as in restoring the image of God back into humanity. That's the title of, uh, of my remark today. And I'm just going to ask you to turn your Bible to the book of Genesis chapter 1. I look at my watch, and my watch is still in Nisa Wolf's clock. So, we're good. <laughs> Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, the Bible records, And God said, Let us make men in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the beds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so the main idea of this text is that the, the, the Bible records that God created man in his own image and in his likeness, which basically means that when God created man, man reflected the image of God perfectly. Now, the first part of the text is that then God said, let us make man in our image. So the Bible tried to explain the, uh, the, the, that God is one, but God is three at the same time. So it's trying to explain the plura pl plurality of God. So if you try to grasp that, you cannot fully understand it. Because I read an author where he says that to fully understand the, the, the idea of that is to lose your mind. But to deny God's existence is to lose your soul. So you will try, but you cannot fully get your head around it. And so the Bible says that God created man in his own image and in his own likeness. So when God created man, man reflected the image of God 100%. But then you know the story as, as, as the story unfolds. If you go to Genesis chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 3, we go to the fall of man. And so man was perfect, but then sin came because he said, the devil is not cunning. He did not walk to sin and uh, Eve and said, Hey, Eve, do you want to be evil? No, he went to Eve, and he was covering all these things. And, and you know the story. Eventually, Eve fell into the devil's trap. And so when men, when, 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 when men sin, that image of God is slowly deteriorating, and men no longer fully reflected the image of God, but he is reflecting the image of that serpent, the image of the devil because men no longer pure. Men became impure. And so when man was in the image of God, he, he, had, he had this dominion over everything. But once man succumbed to the, to, to the trick of the devil, he then reflected the image of the serpent. He no longer reflected God's image. And so by, 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 by subjecting to the serpent, he reflected the image of the snake. And so all throughout the Bible you see this, this fall of man where man reflecting this animalistic nature and it began by Cain killing Abel. This is animalistic. It is not God's original plan. But Cain killed Abel. And then you read on to Genesis chapter 6 you see the people before the flood. The Bible says that the conditions of their heart and, and their thoughts were evil continuously. And it got to a point where 
it, it, it repented God that God had created mankind. Now, I was reading that text one time, and I, was, I thought to myself, you know, it doesn't take a lot for... You see, some people are so tempered. It doesn't take a lot for them to snap. But if you look at God, it doesn't take a little bit... It doesn't take a little for God to snap. But the fact that the Bible says that it had repented God, that he had created mankind, then it, 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 it's trying to tell us that Men had gotten to a point where God was said, okay, enough. I cannot tolerate that anymore. And so he withdrew his spirit because their minds are, their minds are distorted and, and, and contorted and polluted by sin. And it got to a point where it repented God that he had made man. Now, I was reading a book. It's called Devolution. And I'm not, re I'm not recommending that book. I read that book for just um, academic purposes. And that's a very interesting debate between a guy. He's a scientist. His name is Huxley. And a bishop. He's also a scientist too. And his name is Wilberforce. And uh, they were debating. And this Wilberforce was trying to disprove this theory of evolution. And Huxley was trying to move it forward and try to come up with all this thing. And this book is called um, Devolution, where um, Darwin says that life began from like a simple cell, but that book sees it from a different perspective. He was saying that life did not begin from a simple cell, but it begins from a complex cell. So not from life begins from small to big, but life begins from big to small. And I'm not recommending that book, but it's, it's really interesting because when I read that book, it says that Wilberforce was telling Huxley, he was saying that if you can trace your ancestor back, like if you can trace your ancestor from ape, then he said, why from your granddad's side, why can't you trace your ancestor from your grandma's side, which is an ape? He was trying to stay up laugh in the audience. And then uh, Huxley said, I'm not ashamed to be an ape, to be a descendant of ape because considering how man has become, how sinful and how, how polluted and how how spoiled man has become over time. I'm not ashamed to be a descendant from an ape. So that's coming from an, uh, from, from an atheist point of view. Now, what I'm trying to stress here is when you look at this anti-Diluvian time, they had gotten to a point where they had pushed the envelope and it got to a point where God was like, all right, enough is enough. And so he drew a line and there was this guy, he preached at Mount Covert yesterday, and he made a point. He said that historians have suggested that back in that day, the, the number of people living on the earth was at least 5 billion people before the flood. And so if you take that, and if you look at the scripture, the Bible says that God saw that Noah was just. And out of these 5 billion people, God picked Noah. And that's, that tells us how bad humans were back then out of these five billion people only the upright man was Noah and so when you read in the book of Revelation you see the 144,000 standing on the sea of glass you are not seeing man's goodness but you are seeing God's determination to save some messed up people from this messed up world and and you see man's wickedness, God's goodness. Man's hatred, God's goodness. Man's, man's rebelliousness, you see God's love. So you are seeing God's constant perseverance to save human. So someone told me, say, even though when you make the devil your lover, Christ does not give up on you. Mm -hmm. And then if you look at it, some of us in church, we try to give up on people, which is not what Christ would have wanted us to do. So man's mind became polluted. So in every one of us, there is this constant battle going on. We want to be good, but then there's something pulling on us to try to get us to be bad. We want to say good things, nice things, but then there's something pulling on us to say bad things and gossip and spread all these lies about one another. And that is human nature. But it is interesting because if you look at the book of Revelation, 
that's now God is trying to describe the people. And he could, in the book of Daniel and in the book of Revelation, when God, when he wanted to describe the people, he was looking for something to describe people. And the best he could come up with was describing them in, tem, in, in, in like in the prophetic terms, he was using the beast and, and these animals to describe the people. So you look at the characteristics of the lion, the bear, the leopard, and the fourth and the terrible beast of Revelation, all this in the book of Daniel chapter 7, all these things that have in common, they are so aggressive. And so the plan of salvation or the plan of restoration, it boils down to this, where God is trying to remove this animalistic nature in us and try to restore back the image of God. That lost image, he wants to restore it back into us. And so once when the image of God is restored in men, then men will have dominion, according to Exodus chapter 20, 126, where it says, when men fully reflected the image of God, he had dominion over all these beasts. And then over time, it lost that because of sin. But the plan of redemption boils down to that point. When God restored the image of his image back into us, then we will get to that stage where men will once again have dominion over the beast and over, the, over everything. And if you look at Ivor Myers, he's, very, he's specialized in the subject. He pulls it out real well. Now, in a sense, when, 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 when the church, uh, or we as individuals, or church collectively as, as a church, when we reflect the image of God, we have got nothing to fear. Yes. And so you see now, if you look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it is, it is uh, full of this gospel. And so, like I said, if you go to Revelation chapter 14, verse 1, we're just going to go there. Now, Revelation chapter 14, verse 1 says that, Then I looked, and behold, that John was saying, he said, He looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name, return on their foreheads. Now I'm talking about restoration here. So, so like I said, if you see this, seven, at least five billion people back in those days, and God could find only one upright man, when I look at that, I, I, and every time when I look at having that idea in my mind, and every time when I look at the book of Revelation chapter 14 verse 1, I couldn't get... Uh, I couldn't care whether it's symbolic or whether it's, it's, it's real or it's literal or it's symbolic, but it is showing God's determination to save some messed up people from this messed up world. And sometimes I wonder where God's going to get that many people from considering, the, the, considering this lifestyle. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to use a good word considering humans' attitude in this day and age. Now the Bible says that they have the Father's name written in their forehead. This 144,000 having the Father's name written on their foreheads. And in some, if you look at some of the other verses, parallel verses, instead of saying the Father's name, it says the seal on their foreheads. Now, the question is, what is the image or the name or the mark of God? Now, that's the part where I want to spend at least a little bit more time, so we uh, try to get, but I'm just going to come, approach it in a, in, in a different way where you may have not thought about it. And so I'm going to ask you to think with me for the next 20 minutes. I'm just going to delve into that one. So the question is, what is the image or name or the mark of God? I'm talking about restoration here, and I wanted to get that. Now, you go to Exodus chapter 33. Now, Exodus chapter 33, verse 18 to 19, that's when Moses was telling God, he said he wanted to see God. And Exodus chapter 33, verses 18 and 19, he said, Moses said, please, show me your glory. And verse 19, he said, Then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you 
and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. That's what the Lord says. He said, I will make my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So the point here is God says, I will make my goodness pass before you, and I will make, proclaim my name before you. And I wanted to get that point because it's inter interesting. Now, if you go down to the next chapter, verse 34, verse 6, that's what, in verse 6 he says, And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed. Now, that's the name of the Lord. That's what he proclaimed. He said, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty and all these things. But I'm, I'm focusing on verse 6 where he says, And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, that's the name of the Lord now, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and in truth. And you can read all these things. So when I read that text, automatically the, the, the other text that comes into my mind was in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. And what does, what's that text talking about? It was talking about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And I've got a chart, but like I said, I didn't bring the chart. So if you look at Genesis, Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, closely, and if you look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, closely, you'll see that these two are together. So in other words, Paul, when he talked about the fruit of the Spirit, he was quoting Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. So in other words, he was quoting the name of the Lord. Now it's interesting here because Ellen White says that the law is what? The transcript of God's character. So we, here we have in the book of Exodus where God was proclaiming his name. And then you have the book of Galatians where Paul quoting the text. And he was quoting, he was writing, he was quoting the text. But he introduces someone special into it. What did he say? He said the fruit of the spirit. So in other words, he if you look at it, the fruit of the Spirit is law simplified. Or, in other words, if you look at it, the fruit of the Spirit is, is somewhat like mathematical term where if you pull something out from something, they could derive it from something. So, in other words, the fruit of the Spirit is, is like a derivative of the law. It's pulled out from the law. Or it is the law simplified. That's why Alan White says that in Great Controversy, page 231, it says, paragraph 1, he said, for the law is the transcript of God's character. You see, in, in the Old Testament, God was in the center stage. And in the New Testament, when Christ was here, he was in the center stage. And after Christ has left, the Holy Spirit was in the center stage in the time of Paul. So when he was quoting the text, he introduced someone special in it, and he, was, he introduced the Holy Spirit into it. Now it gets interesting because I don't want you to lose me on that. That's, that's just one of the main points I want to go and touch. Now so Paul through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit quoted Exodus chapter 34 verse 6 but this time he introduces a very important person of the Godhead and that, that person is the Holy Spirit because like I said during the Old Testament God was in the center stage. He was dealing with people directly and then you come to the New Testament in the time of Christ. Jesus was in the center stage. He was dealing with the people directly. But when Christ left now, we have the Holy Spirit in the center stage. He was dealing with the people directly. That's why before Jesus left, he said, it is what, in John chapter 16 verse 7, Jesus said, it is expedient for you that I go away. Or in other words, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Comforter will not come. So Christ was highlighting the importance of the Holy Spirit and it gets better. I want you to pay attention. Now, John chapter 8 verse 32 reads, You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Now I'm talking about why Christ said that it is important that I go away because I want the Comforter to come. Now I want you to get, because I'm going to connect this one before I sit down. John chapter 8 verse 32 re reads, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. 
Now, I read in the uh, messages to young people where it says that truthfulness and integrity are attributes of God. And he who possesses those attributes possesses a power that is invincible. So truthfulness is invincible. So John says that you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. So my question then is how do I get to the truth? Now John chapter 16 verse 13 again it reads, How be it when the spirit of truth come, he will guide you into all truth. And whatever he speak will not from himself, but whatever he hears from me, he will speak. So it is the Holy Spirit that leads us to the truth. And what is the truth? John chapter 14 verse 6 says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man goes to the Father except through me. So you're seeing the trend here? The Bible says that in order for you to be free, you need to know the truth. And how do you get to the truth? The, whole, the Bible then says that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, will lead you on into, the, into all truth. And what is truth? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So it is the Holy Spirit that leads us to Jesus. And then Jesus says, no man goes to the Father except through me. So it is the Holy Spirit that leads us to Jesus. And through Christ, we have access to the Father. Now, it, it gets more interesting here. Because John chapter 16, verse 7, again, it says that it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter, the, or the, 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 the Greek word for comforter means parakletos or parakletos, depending on your accent. And what it means is that someone that comes alongside you and walk with you and talks with you. That's why it is important because Jesus said that it's to your advantage that I go away. And so when the Holy Spirit comes in Steps to Christ, page... I, I want to tie all this in so it's sinking. In Steps to Christ, page 74 to 75, it says... Now, Ellen White was quoting that text that I read earlier on um, John chapter 16, verse 7, where it says, It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I go not away, the comforter will not come. So what Ellen White commanded in um, Steps to Christ, page 74, she said, Henceforth, through the Spirit, Christ was to abide continually with his children. And I wanted to get that point. Where, and, he, and he said, And their union with him was much more closer than when Christ was personally with them. So when the Holy Spirit takes residence in, in, in their life, through the presence of the Holy Spirit, Christ comes into their life. And then they have the access to the Father. That's why their union with Christ was much more closer and much more personal than when Christ was personally with them. Because you see, Christ is like the son of righteousness according to Malachi's metaphor. So what the son does is that when, when Christ, the son of righteousness, when he comes into our life and then he shines into the secret chambers of our life, and then he begins to unfreeze all these freezing chambers of our life. And then he liquefies it. And then he melts it. And he gets rid of all this stuff. And one thing that the Holy Spirit does is like he's like a fire. And what fire does is it purifies stuff. It burns stuff and it purifies and it cleans them. And then the Holy Spirit comes and shines into the secret chambers of our life. Where, where, where some of us don't know that we have all these things. The fire from the throne of God shines into these dark chambers of our life and then he begins to burn the lust, the envy, the gossip, the hatred and all these things. It begins to burn it and then it burns it and it purifies it and then it cleans it. And when Christ comes into our life, then that sun of righteousness, it shines into all the darkest chambers of our life and, and, and unfreeze those freezing chambers and make us clean. And, and in other words, he's reflecting and burn all these dark images, get it out of the way. And that is the process of, of restoration, restoration, restoring us back to the image where God wants us originally to be. That's why in, in, in the book of Psalms chapter 51, verse uh, 9, 10, 11, 12, one of the prayers that everyone loves, where it says, Create in me a clean heart, O Lord, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And then it says, Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit away from me. And restore unto me the joy of your salvation. And uphold me with your free spirit. 
But people stop there. They don't go further. But if you go down a little bit further, the Bible says that, and I will teach the transgressors your way. Now, that is the key to a powerful ministry. What, he, what, 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 what David says was that, fill me with your Holy Spirit. And once you fill me with the Holy Spirit, then I will go out and teach the transgressors your way. Is that what happened in, 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 in Acts chapter 2? They were in the upper room. They were praying. And the Holy Spirit in the symbol of fire rested upon their heart. And once when the Holy Spirit rested upon their heart, it consumes them of the self and got rid of it. And then when they went out, they turned their known world upside down. They shook it. Now that is the power of the Holy Spirit. It is expedient for you that I go away. Christ said, it is to your advantage that I go away. Now, you see, Christ doesn't waste words. He, he, he says what he means and he means what he says. Now, if you want another touch, I'm just going to delve into the book of Genesis chapter 1. And we'll look at verse 2. I'm going to approach it in a different angle again. Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Now, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2 reads, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering. Or if you have KJV, it says, And the Spirit of God moved on the surface of the deep. Now, I wanted to get that point because it is an important one. I'm going to read it again where it says that the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. You see, the point here is that before the spoken word becomes living word, before, prior to the movement of the Holy Spirit on the face of the deep, everything was chaos. It was total chaos. Nothing good. It was a total vacuum. It was all a mess. But when everything was in a constant mess, nothing happened. But then you have the Holy Spirit moving on the face of the deep. And after the Holy Spirit had established his presence in this mess, then God spoke. Then God spoke. Then God spoke. After the Holy Spirit established his presence on the face of this messed up world, then God spoke. And the spoken word becomes the living word. So in other words, I'm going to work on that and bring it out. You'll get it soon. In other words, the earth was useless. But the Holy Spirit was, but the Spirit of God moved. And after the Spirit of God moved, then God said nine times. And the spoken word becomes the living word. And the word brings light when there's darkness. After the presence of the Holy Spirit already established himself on it. The word brings light when there's darkness. And the word reaches into the firmament and create a dry land, a solid foundation for me to stand on. And the word bears fruit of, out of the dry land. And then it puts sun and moon and stars up there on the sky. Acts as a season. And acts as a word. Acts as a, um, he put the season so the word is a guide to me. And so the word brings life where there's no life. After the Holy Spirit manifests his presence on the face of the deep. So nothing happened until the Holy Spirit established himself. His presence there. And once the presence of the Holy Spirit was there, then God spoke, and the spoken word becomes the living word. Now, why I stress that? Because do you get to a point where sometimes the spoken word is too boring? You, you don't really understand. You don't really get what's in there. I can testify because I was there. Every time when I pick up the Bible, it's like one of the most boring books. You just stare at it and nothing seems to be jumping out of the pages and it just slip. But one time I heard a sermon about the importance of the Holy Spirit and I prayed, I said, Lord, I really need to understand that. 
I'm asking you that please, can you fill me with your Holy Spirit? And when the Holy Spirit established himself on this, when it was all messed up and mixed up, then the spoken word, when I look at this word, the spoken word, it's no longer this most boring book. It's like every time when you look at the words, this, this, when you open the first pages of the Bible, those words begin to jump out of these pages and fill the vacuum of your life. And when the Holy Spirit manifests himself in your life, then the spoken word will become a living word in your life. So are you seeing the importance of the Holy Spirit when it comes to... And, and when God, after the Holy Spirit manifests his presence, then God created everything. It was all perfect. That was during creation. But then, like I told you, everything be began to drop into this big mess because man began to listen to the enemy. But then, as soon as man sinned, there was a plan of redemption. That's what Ellen White says. Now, you go to... I'm talking about the importance of the Holy Spirit. So, you go to the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 18. Now, before God created everything, there was the presence of the Holy Spirit manifesting itself. And then everything was all messed up. And God said, all right, we're going to go, we're going to do something. And then this plan of redemption happened to, 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 to restore man back to the original plan. And if you go to 1 verse 18, the Bible says, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary, Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Now I sing the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Christ, in order for Christ to come down to begin this work of restoration, the Holy Spirit was there already. So it was through the ministry of the Holy Spirit that Christ came into the world. It was through the ministry of the Holy Spirit that Christ, the living word, came into the world and walked among men and dwelt among men and showed them the way to the Father. And the word became flesh through the ministry of the Holy Spirit and dwelt among men and showed them the right from the wrong. So are you seeing the trend here, how important and how vital the, the Holy Spirit is? So before Jesus was born as the human, body into, human, human baby into the world, before he began this earthly ministry of restoring his father's image back to his people, before this ministry began, the ministry of restoration, before the light shines into this world that is darkened by sin, before the bread of life becomes, before the bread of life comes and satisfies people of their hunger for righteousness, the people who are languishing in sin, Before all this thing happened, the Holy Spirit already manifest himself. And through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, Christ came into the world and began this ministry of restoration. You see, before, before the creation, you have the Holy Spirit. And before the restoration into God's image, through the ministry of Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. Now, what's the significance about this? The significant about the, the the most significant thing about it is, is that during the creation the earth was useless in a very special sense. We are like that. We are messed up and, 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 and corrupted by sin. And we are so broken. But when, when, when the Holy Spirit, when we ask Him to come into our life and manifest His presence in our life, then the Spirit gives life to the Word. And the spoken word becomes the living word, like the Bible says. And the word becomes flesh and dwelt among men. And when you have the Holy Spirit manifesting himself, his presence in your life, then if you are struggling with anger, hatred, bitterness, gossip, lust, and all these things, like I said, when you have the Holy Spirit manifesting his presence in your life, he's like the fire from the throne of God. He comes into our life. And, and goes into the secret chambers of our life and start burn, 
burn out all the lust, the anxiety, the depression, and all these things that try to pull us down. When that fire comes into our life, he burns it. And then he prepares it for, the, for Christ to come into our life. And when Christ comes, he's the son of righteousness. He shines into the darkest chambers of our life and begins to unfreeze all these freezing chambers. And then through that, we can have this one-on-one -on -one communion with God. And when Christ comes back, he's going to clean all this messed up and mixed up world. And, and you see, when Christ comes back, he's going to rescue people who are fireproof. And you have to experience this fire before you, when Christ comes. Because when Christ comes, his glory is going to strike people there. And you have to get accustomed to that glory. And you can have that glory now by allowing the presence of the Holy Spirit into your life. And when that fire comes into your life, it bends out all these things and it makes you worthy to stand. And when Christ comes, we, we won't be running into the hills and crying for all these rocks and hills to fall on us. But like the book of Isaiah said, we will be waiting patiently and say, this is our Lord. We have been waiting for him and he will come and save us and we'll rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Now going back to the topic before I sit down, the process of restoration, how are we going to be restored back to his image? It is through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. How do we receive the Holy Spirit? In Mark chapter 11, Christ made it plain. He said, you can ask a father for a stone, he can, uh, for bread, or he will give you a stone, or you ask your father for a fish, he give you a snake. But if you ask your heavenly father for the Holy Spirit, the Bible, say, the Bible did not say that he may give it to you, but the Bible says that if you ask the Father for the Holy Spirit, he will give it to you. That shows how vital and how important the Holy Spirit is. So when he comes into our life, like what he did to the world when it was all messed up. When it was all messed up, before the spoken word becomes the living word, the Holy Spirit establishes his presence. And before this spoken word becomes a living word in this mixed up and messed up self, it is wiser to invite the Holy Spirit. And once the Holy Spirit comes into our life, it makes it more easier for the process of restoration to take place in our life. May God add his blessing. Amen.